All right, so welcome everyone to the Northeast Digestion Roundtable sponsored by NEVRA. These are quarterly informal meetings. We get together and talk about AD operations and any, any kinds of uh, uh, advice and we, we try to help each other. Uh, just if you could just stay on mute, you should be automatically muted when you come in, but we'd appreciate that. We're going to record this and uh, Chris will give me his slides. We'll share those with you after, but we'd like to get right into it and allow some time for questions and answers at the end. So if you want to give me your questions as we're going through, you can type it in the chat. That would be helpful. But at the end, we'll certainly unmute everyone so we can have a discussion. Uh, so today we're going to talk about vetting anaerobic digester feedstocks and our presenters today are Chris Mullen and Bob Wimmer and if you guys could just put your cameras on that'd be great. Uh, Chris is a principal engineer with Brown and Caldwell. He works in their Andover Mass office. He is their solids process and innovation lead He's work, he works primarily on solid processes and system designs over his 15-year career there. He holds a BS in marine and freshwater biology from the University of New Hampshire and a MS in environmental engineering and a PhD in civil engineering from Virginia Tech, which is a great biosolids research uh, hub, by the way. Bob, Bob Wimmer, he's the engineering manager for water and wastewater at Energy Systems Group. It's based out of Evansville, Indiana. Bob's been working in Maryland for the past 18 years and leading ESG's efforts for water and wastewater treatment plant optimization and op operational savings. He's focused on biosolids and energy recovery. And over the past five years, Bob has designed, commissioned, and supported the operations of six co-digestion co facilities, very large ones accepting high strength organic wastes. Uh, Bob has a BS in dairy science and an MS in environmental engineering from Virginia Tech, along with two years experience with keeping Chris Muller from destroying the research lab. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, I'm going to turn over the discussion to Chris from Brown and Corwell. Okay. Thank you, Janine. And yeah, welcome everybody. Uh, Happy New Year and glad to be, well, eventually we'll be all not virtual, but we're getting there. Um, yeah, so yeah, it's funny. Bob and I are both uh, Hokies and yeah, we're at the same time. And yeah, he kept me out of a lot of trouble. Uh, probably kept the place standing, but yes, we're uh, gonna talk today about vetting feedstocks. And I really look at it as, you know, if I wanna put something other than sludge in my digester, how do I decide, right? And like, that's the way we wanna do it. And what we thought today, you know, when Bob and I talked sober was, why don't we do two different, two, two approaches here, right? There's a, um, uh, you know, I would say the engine, you know, the, the process technical approach that that's what I'm going to talk about, you know, in terms of uh, looking at different characteristics of feedstocks and how we decide and what we decide on, and, you know, what things you want to consider and what experiences I've had um, through the food facilities and projects I've worked on. And then Bob's um, going to talk um, really from the, the practitioner t t uh, perspective. Um, and, and, and as is, uh, you know, uh, description his uh, bio and uh, suggested, you know, he that's what his com company does is essentially co-digestion programs. So there's, you know, the um, theoretical side, then there's the applied side, and so we thought there'd be kind of a nice mix of things here to cover over the next, you know, 45 minutes or so, and as we go through, and you know, yeah, we can answer questions as we go or at the end, however, wh whatever kind of way we go go forward here. So. I'm going to start off here, and this 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 graphic I think probably people have seen before, but this is you know always the promise of bringing something other than uh, putting up something other than sludge in a digester, right? You can get a lot more gas, and gas is energy, and gas is becoming very significant revenue, uh, and you can see there's all kinds of different things down here, but the two bars that I want to point out were the red ones, and those are typical methane yields for sewage sludges. And you can see this down somewhere near that 0.2 cubic meters per kilogram of BS. And the takeaway is here, well, things that we normally don't want to de deal with or manage, things like fog, have, you know, upwards of four times the methane potential 
of our sludge. So if we're looking to be more sustainable and energy efficient, we can see that there's this promise here, hey, we can bring this stuff in, get more gas. But what are the things we have to think about when we do this? Well, a lot's changed over time um, when we're looking at these things. You know, that, that graphic is, oh, I don't want to say maybe 10 years old now, um, but people are also looking at bringing in high strength wastes may have some ancillary benefits that we aren't necessarily always or haven't always taken a bit uh, into account. And this is some work that um, came out in 2015. Um, another Hokie was involved in this as well. That would be Matt Higgins. Um, but at Bucknell, and they were looking at uh, synergistic digestion. Basically, if I add a bunch of high strength waste in, people are seeing that the digester process performs even better. So now we're talking about more gas, potentially less sludge, um, and that this work showed that. Um, others have shown this is some work from Dan Zinnemer uh, back in 2008. So, you know, where we're starting to build this idea that, hey, this isn't just, uh, you know, there's really some overall benefits here that we want to take advantage of, and how do we now make sure we're going to get the right ones to get the maximum advantage? But then also, as Bob will talk about, what does that mean from a you know, realistic or real project execution um, side of things? So when we, when we look at co-digestion, really, you know, it, 10 years ago, we didn't have a lot of information. This is kind of about the time frame when this started to become a real common practice or started becoming a more common practice. And this substrate vetting piece ended up here on the front end. And, you know, we would look at how much is out there and try to figure out what the best methane potential was. And then we start to think about all these other constraints and impacts throughout the process. And over time, what we've seen is that one, as facilities have run continuously more and more uh, and brought in different things, we've learned a lot. So we can learn a lot from just, you know, a calling the, the, the plant down the road or across the country and saying, you, you brought this stuff in and how did it work? You know, I think of an example that the plant pictured here is um, the Gresham, Oregon plant. And they brought in fog and high strength waste all throughout the years. And one time we got involved with them, talking to them, and they wanted to check out bringing in um, cherry brine waste. And they thought, you know, they could get some uh, benefit out of it. And you think, well, yeah, you know, there's some sugars in there and everything else. And you get some gas. It's a liquid, super easy to move around, pump around. Well, the high salt content made their digester very unhappy. Um, so it didn't take very much before we, we found out that, you know, that maybe wasn't such a great idea. So now that's on that list of, hey, got to think about that one before we, we do that. And also the universities, you know, they saw the work from uh, Matt Higgins' group there uh, earlier and Dr. Zittermer's group there. There's more information coming from universities now that are really kind of trying to start to refine some of these questions and, and give us better information. So it's not quite the black box we were 10 years ago, but we're still learning. And then there's, I would say still, there's a ways to go, right? Because we don't have 20, 30, 40, 50, you know, 100 years of operations that we have for sludge digestion that we do for these, these materials, but it's getting there. And so it's helped, you know, I think as we go forward, this process will become easier and easier and more and more streamlined. But also as we move forward, the other things we've had to think about are other elements of the digestion process as we've intensified it. And that's essentially what we're doing is we're bringing in more feedstocks, creating more gas in that same volume. We're intensifying the process. Well, there's other factors that we now start to consider. You know, we have the work that was done talking about rapid volume expansion and drastic shifts in biogas are one of those things that cause volume expansion events. So don't changes in viscosity. So how do these materials interact with the digester? which ones are good at it, which ones are bad at it. Um, the availability of feedstocks, we're seeing more and more uh, municipalities moving towards organics diversion. So it's not always just, hey, we're gonna take the liquid waste that comes from the food processor as a bog, but maybe now there's, hey, there's, there's significant amounts of source separated food waste that are starting to come into the market. Do those make sense to bring in? What do I need to consider to do that? And how do they compare to other things? And how does it interact with our infrastructure? Um, uh, the changes in the biosolids management opportunities. <laughs> Typically when we, you know, the, the work earlier I sh meant sh showed you earlier means that, you know, yes, you can get um, more or less solids overall sometimes with digestion, but often when we're bringing more materials and we're handling more solids in the e at the end than we were with just sludge alone. So how does the local biosolids market 
how does you know the, those management opportunities or lack thereof uh, impact the decision whether to bring or create more biosolids at the end by bringing in these materials? Um, the influence of these high strength wastes on your renewal, if you're doing a vehicle fuel, right? The RINs, the high value for the, 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 the gas, um, you know, a lot of these aren't considered cellulosic wastes, so they do have an impact. And how will that play out eventually, hopefully, <laughs> so that we can still take get the advantages from the sludge, but if we bring in fogs and things like that, how do we parse that and make make a good economic decision? And again, Bob will, Bob's got some experience with that, and so he'll be he'll be talking some more about that as well. And then you know PFAS and other CECs, while well, maybe not necessarily in the materials we're bringing in, they're attached to the biosolids, which these extra materials now are impacting. So it's it's getting getting to a bigger picture of how do I pick and choose what I'm going to do, um, which is I guess the kind of some of the fun part of, the, <laughs> of this process. So, you, you know, it's really a mix, right? We've got to balance things out. We've got our process issues that we have to consider. We've got our market conditions, and I'm, I'll talk a little bit about that, and then the economic conditions. And I, I'm going to leave a lot of that to Bob because that's the work he's been doing. But, you know, you balance all of these items and you create your mix of feedstocks, and how do I prioritize that mix to what I want to bring in? So, you know, when I look at this from a perspective taking all the way back, you know, what do you need to do when you're going to start to think about bringing in feedstocks and then also, you know, selecting the ones that you want uh, to, 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 uh, to, to digest and co-digest? You've got a benchmark. You know, first of all, you got to know your facility, right? What are its limitations? Where is its capacities? Um, and, um, and, you know, where do you stand at, at, at this point? And then I think the next step is then you define your project boundaries. Like what, what am I trying to do? Is it organics diversion, maximize biogas production, maximize revenue? How do those decisions or goals fit with my facility? And then when I perform my market sounding, how do those materials in my market meet those goals? And then you have to kind of, it's kind of a little bit of an iterative process, but you confirm it and you go back and say, all right, does this make sense? Does this make sense? And then you can develop your your um, program that way, and and you know it, it can be, uh, and it, and some of these results can range. You know, it can range from, hey, I'm just going to open the doors and see what comes in, to I'm going to work with very specific haulers, very specific producers to use my limited capacity to get the maximum benefit that I'm looking for. And so this is kind of you know a very general way of starting to think about how we're going to do this vetting process. But taking you know. As an engineer and a biologist and you know a, a sludge nerd, I, <laughs> I do like to look in the inside of the plant. And you know, and when we're starting to talk about that benchmarking side of things, it's you know, you know, where do I stand? What 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 do I need to consider? And then these are all the things that we want to think about, right? Like we have to have considerations around the big two, right? Or organic and hydraulic capacity. Do I have a room in my digester to put it in? Um, your heating system, do I have uh, capacity to heat this stuff up? And sometimes these materials change. We were looking at some food waste addition at a, um, at a plant and what we, one of the concerns we had was the existing heating system with the change in solids concentration, changes in the heat transfer characteristics. And so did we have the right capacity in the heat exchangers even to make, make some of those changes? So some of this is very nuanced at times. And um, depending where you are on this, understanding the system, you know, you can say, oh yeah, I'm not worried about that, or I need to consider some of these things. So everybody's a little bit, going to be a little bit different. Um, a couple of the other ones I think, you know, we want to think about on a bigger perspective too, are the biogas systems in use, right? Do I have enough pipes? If it's going to produce too much gas for me to move it, or do I need to, you know, make some changes there? And, or do I have a use for it? The other big one we've seen to start to pop up here is air permits, especially folks with low NOx limits. You've got a lot of things with high, high nitrogen coming in. Those are increasing ammonia concentrations in the gas and impacting NOx. So there's, you know, just these are things that aren't necessarily unsolvable, but when you're looking at your feedstocks, it's like, well, if I had a really sugary waste or a protein waste, maybe if I know I have a, a low NOx limit, I better, you know, maybe I'll lean towards that sugary waste that doesn't carry as much protein um, in a, a of ultimately uh, nitrogen that can end up in your gas. Um, and then you want to maybe think about things like your dewatering. We've talked about extra solids, but also some materials have 
shown and specifically some of the ways that come from um, some of the dairy processing facilities have a tendency to deteriorate your dewaterability. And so you balance off that energy gain, the tipping fee gain against maybe I get some wetter cake and can my biosolids, you know, end users be okay with a few points off on the cake? Can I survive the cost differential of hauling wetter cake? And so these are things we all want to talk about and think about. And then the other things is when this stuff breaks down in our digesters, we're going to get more things like ammonia, phosphorus, sulfur, and you know, ammonia and phosphorus. Well, there there are two two out of the three for the um, struvite formation. Are we going to create a problem that we didn't have in the past? So it's just lots of little things to think about here. And so let's just kind of dig into a little bit of them. Uh, you know, really the takeaway here is on this graphic here is you know I've shown kind of traditional peak loading design criteria for conventional sewage sludge digesters. Well, here's Gresham, Oregon, who's been doing co-digestion for a number of years. They run your very conventional meso complete mix system. They're operating on average about 0.2 pounds per cubic feet per day. You know, normally we'll design a digester peaking around somewhere around 0.15. So you have maybe a 25% capacity increase that you can get with some of these high strength wastes because they don't break down just like sludges do. So um, when you're set, thinking about how much you can take in, you want to maybe think about this from a little bit different perspective than we would with a conventional sewage sludge digester and saying, well, these are our hard limits. And what we're seeing is that these processes can operate at fairly high loading rates and be very stable. And you can see East Bay Mud when they ran their food waste pilot was way up, <laughs> up here. Um, and I think Bob will talk maybe a little bit about this in his work, but some of the work they've done, and we've got a facility with them starting up in Montpelier, which is based on a recuperative thickening concept, is another way to gain back your capacity if you want to basically break that HRT and solids retention time limitation. So if I've got real liquidy waste like soda pop waste that produces a lot of gas but carries a lot of liquid, this might be one way to kind of grab back capacity. And, and so these are the things we, you know, ultimately want to consider and then in, when we're selecting our waste is where is my capacity, but then also what might I do to amend it? And does the things I have to do to amend that capacity to get that material in the door still make sense financially for us? So that's one element of it. And then, you know, the other thing, it's, it is a value, it takes a little time, but is coming in and, and actually starting to characterize some of these materials. And, you know, there's something to be said for, you know, on these characterization efforts. One, it's good to help you kind of predict your economics, and two, it can kind of highlight some of the things we didn't think about. This was some work I did a long ways back with the city of Tacoma, and the one thing I like to point out about this is, you know, here's your, their sludge. This was what's going to the anaerobic digesters. Um, it, it's an ATAD sludge. They pre-pasteurize with ATAD and then bring it in. And you can see, you know, the characteristics here, relatively low TKN and phosphorus. Well, at the time we were talking to this blood processing uh, facility, uh, it was a slaughterhouse that had blood to get rid of. And they were willing to haul it a long ways and pay a very high tip fee to get rid of it. And what we saw was when we characterized it, yeah, there's a lot of COD, so that's a lot of gas, about twice, and it's probably gonna break down very well. But at the same time, we had a huge amount of ammonia or ammonia potential in that to TKN at 142,000 compared to 1700 for sludge. So that would have been a problem there. And also the five times the amount of phosphorus. Um, so some of these things, you know, getting a good characterization of them can head off some of the, if, if you know, we're focused just on that COD and that gas potential, um, you can head off some of these uh, issues in the future or issues down the road that once you start accepting it. Um, you know, you, you can save yourself a headache. In fact, at this level, we estimated that, and this plant's about a 25 MGD plant on average, that under, during their lower flow conditions, we would actually see effluent changes in their overall ammonia leaving the plant just from bringing this material in. Not also to say when we did the math, it was going to come out that this is going to be about, um, that'd be enough ammonia to basically upset the digesters. <laughs> so it's a pr pretty, pretty, you know, Attractive, but for the quantities they wanted to bring in, it just that feedstock didn't make a lot of sense, right? Money-wise, it would have made a lot of sense. Gas-wise, it made sense, but 
from a um, actual running the facility. Um, it, it didn't. Now that doesn't mean you can't take it in. Um, East Bay Mud, I know, takes blood waste products in, but it's mixed in and diluted down with a variety of other things. So it's getting into that part of the vetting process will then be too is what does my mix look like? Is it a single thing or is it 150 different things? So this can be very valuable um, to doing that. But when you go into these materials uh, uh, evaluations things, it's that you get, there are things to think about. Like example, fog is one of the trickier ones to do um, because it's all, it's, it's, if you look at some of the th numbers out there, you'll see it ranging from say 1% to 15%. And some of that's driven by how the material is collected, if they allow for pump backs or do you require full pump outs, so you have a more dilute material or a thicker material. Um, how does that material um, behave? You know, if you put it in a truck, drive it around for most of the morning and comes in, it's going to separate. Mm -hmm. And how are you then um, doing some of the work to composite that and catch it and get a good characterization? A couple of studies, one the H HRSD did a, a few years ago, you know, they actually took the time, dumped, it, dumped the entire contents out into a bigger tank, mixed it around, and then sampled it to get a kind of a more average. And so if you, if you look at studies like that, the average somewhere comes down around in that four to five percent solids range, just if you're interested, <laughs> um, uh, rather than the one to 15 percent. Um, another thing I've seen too is if you're going to take in materials from food processors, you know, and you're thinking about when, when I want to bring that is have a good discussion with them about what do they do throughout the year? Is it just one line and one product or are you seeing multiple lines and multiple products coming throughout the year so that your waste that you're accepting may look like something in the spring, but when the fall comes around or winter comes around and they're producing, eggnog and everything else, then it looks a whole, whole lot different and has different handling characteristics. So these are good discussions to have. One, one facility I work with, um, some of the, you know, they were seeing with some of their processes, much higher phosphorus in the return material rather than um, at, during other times of the year. So getting, you know, a handle on that, whether you directly sample it or, um, or you know, just talk to the folks. Uh, it can be very helpful. Um, you know, this was another, this picture down here to the right was another good example of one that was uh, a um, egg processing plant. And they're like, oh, we have all this egg waste and we'd love to have, you know, have you guys come and take it. And we, we showed up there and I was like, well, I don't think that <laughs> dirt filled lagoon is going to be quite what we want to pump out and handle, but it was, it was, you know, valuable in just seeing it as well. So other things that consider in vetting your feedstocks is how those feedstocks behave with your receiving facilities and your mix, uh, and your existing um, digestion system. You know, if you don't have very effective mixing, things like fog can be more difficult. Um, I've talked to operators who've said that you know um, they get scum layers and fog layers that build up in their digesters and eventually fold over in and create these big blooms of gas that can cause problems. So if it's not well mixed, um, you know, things you might think about moving towards more um, soluble products like uh, soda pop waste and those types of things. Um, same thing for your um, receiving station. This is again, surprising, this, this is a fog facility, but this is the grit that accumulates at the bottom of the fog tank. Uh, once it heats up, there's a lot of grit bound up in that fog and it kind of drops out and accumulates. So how is that? system mixed, how do you manage these types of things? It might, you know, your system's not quite designed to, to be hauling out that type of material. Maybe it's a different product that you want to focus on. Um, so these are all kind of fall into that decision matrix. Um, as I mentioned, you know, the, the mixing impacts with the stratification, you know, the, the other thing is, is you, know, you can get stratification in the tank, which causes those kind of fold in layers, episodic events. But also even in your feeding regime, if you've got um, stratification in your feed tank, and that actually that fog picture on the prior slide was a fog um, tank that was at, uh, doing a demonstration project. And you know, what you can get then is inconsistent strength of feed to the digester um, because you know, in the morning you might be pumping all the water at the bottom, in the afternoon you're pumping the you now thickened material which carries a lot of the gas production. So, and these can, things can lead to, you know, things like volume expansion, as you can see on the right here. That's a severe case where it gets out of the tank. Um, but also it's not always just gas as well. Um, 
these materials can change the viscosity and viscosity is directly tied to gas holdup. So understanding if I, you know, I'm gonna change the, 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 the characteristics of the material in the tank by bringing this new materials in, I wanna make sure that we're, uh, you wanna make sure that you're accounting for that and you know, do you have the right mitigation measures like good mixing, overflows and those types of things. So those are things just to start to think about. Um, and then finally, you know, you can start to really, this is, you know, kind of where if you do that benchmarking on the, on the front end, you can start to say, hey, if I bring this much material in, I know these are my limitations and I need to account for that in my tip fees and, or my capacity assessments. And, um, you know, this was something we did for Tacoma a number of years ago um, where we said this red band represented the overall scope of the co-digestion program, the, the feedstocks they wanted to bring in. And where did it hit issues for them? Well, it wasn't really in the mechanical systems and the heating systems actually tied up with primarily their um, hydraulics and their, and their digest or loading capacity. But um, it, was, it, was, it was informative because you, so you don't accidentally get into you kind of some of these- on for me because my dad has a plan in the background. Sorry, my son's has class <laughs> at the same time. Um, uh, you don't accidentally run into uh, Can you keep uh, it on? an unknown, uh, capacity issue or unforeseen capacity issue, which would require, you know, a capital project or, so these are, these are things that, you know, we, you know, I, I like to think about as I'm going through a, a, a vetting process is that I, you know, we're going to, you know, try to keep the bigger picture in mind and, and not just focus on, you know, the, the tip fee and necessarily the gas potential just to avoid some of these other problems. Now, other things to con consider too here are, you know, what is it gonna do on the backside, right, of your, your, your process. And, you know, the biosolids, once we put it in the digester, we're still gonna have to move this stuff and we wanna use it beneficially. That means we wanna keep up the quality. While understanding what the process is and where the material's coming from can help you. You know, food waste is great material. It's a lot of it. It's consistent, it can be homogenized, but making sure, you know, the trash and debris is out and the process that's being used to produce it for you or you're producing it yourself and processing it yourself isn't gonna you know, end up with little pieces of plastics and those types of things that would degrade the overall quality. And food waste isn't the only one that brings plastic. Here's, you know, this is from grease trap tanks that were holding grease traps and we were pumping them out. And you know, there's lots of plastics that show up in these things too. So making sure that your, your front end is, uh, of your process is um, compatible with what you want to bring in as well, right? If I bring in a DAF float from a food processor, it's likely going to be very clean because it's from the food process itself where these products have been, you know, moved through and in, in, into more of a disposal option. So making sure that those things can um, be considered. And then as I mentioned earlier, the, the whey prop materials and the reduced kick solids. Um, the nice thing is we're starting to also get information though out there. This is some work we were doing with Gresham looking at their changes in dewatering. Um, but one of the things we want to answer here is what happens when you know you add fog and is the fog addition one of those factors that is impacting their dewatering maybe like the way products have. And you know the, it's a little hard to see but these little gray X's are all the fog loads and this is the overall cake solids on the left hand axis. And what you can see is that really there's not a real strong correlation between the fog loading rate and the overall change in dewaterability, which is good. And then some work more recently um, through WERF on food waste is showing that food waste isn't doing this, isn't, isn't having a negative impact either, which is good. So we're starting to get these pieces of information because obviously if something's gonna impact your dewatering, you wanna make sure that it's gonna be caught in your overall, uh, uh, you know, economics surrounding your tip fees and everything else. So, um, you know, but this information is starting to come out, which has, you know, been very helpful. Um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, there's levels of pretreatment and this gets into, if I'm gonna bring this material in, maybe what kind of receiving station I need to build or is the receiving station I have sufficient you know, I often say like, if you can bring it, if you can build a receiving station that will take grease trap waste, most likely it can handle most other liquid waste or liquefied wastes, because grease traps or waste is pretty hard to manage. And in terms of levels of contamination and debris, you know, 
this is an earlier food waste, uh, food processing waste, bottling waste, those types of things. It's very low level. It's, it's not a lot of material debris in there. You can handle it, you know, with a very simple system. And if that's all you were accepting, you get a very rudimentary tank and a pump type setup. You get the grease trap waste. You're going to have to start thinking about heating because the grease wants to stick to everything. Um, and then the, you know, how do I get these plastics out? And then there's a lot of rocks and debris. Um, those tanks are breaking down. And in fact, that fine grit that I showed you earlier is, was problematic at one facility in a, a pilot we were running. This is the stator from a grease tr um, transfer pump. And this lasted seven weeks. Um, so again, if, if, if your facility is not matched up to that, either getting that stuff to settle out or getting it removed, you want to make sure you, you, know, you take into account the, these potential impacts as well. And then obviously food waste, you know, out of, out of the truck is not compatible, but at the same time, it can be processed um, with the, the right facilities and or the right partner, right? Like, um, you know, there's a number of folks out there, waste management being one that comes right off the top of my head, who, you know, are collecting and processing stuff and making stuff that looks basically like waste activated sludge. So just making sure, you know, what you're getting, where you're getting it from, and thinking about what facilities, if you've already got an existing one, what are those facilities going to manage these, these problem pieces so, so that you can, uh, you know, can you keep going forward. For me because I don't, I don't really want my... So really, you know, I as I said, so I've kind of covered on a high level here, the, the process side, the mechanical side of things. I'll talk a little bit about our experience with market, and I'm going to leave the economic side to Bob because I think it's really more beneficial to him. Um, you know, he's got a lot of insight from a, the operations side that I think will be of, of value for you all to hear. So quickly, you know, I'm going to talk, like, you know, why, why would you want to do a market study? And you can do them yourselves. Um, you can hire folks to do them. Uh, you know, there's, I, I, the name's escaping me, the company that there's one out there that now it does, you know, do market soundings for you. How much is out there, where it is, who is, who has it, and you can get that material, you know, that information if you want to hire for that done, or you can do it yourself. But it's really, you know, it's really helpful in understanding what, what that ha it means um, for a program and for what you can potentially expect to get. Um, just as an example, you know, this was something we had done for St. Petersburg, looking at the movement of Greece through their region. And, um, you know, what we're really looking at here is uh, polar greases. Those are your ones from uh, food processing. You know, non-polars are the stuff that come off your car washes and everything in your oil change facilities, right? That's your uh, hydrocarbon-based ones. Well, if you've got, you know, grease trap waste, it can go a variety of different ways. What we wanted that ended up here at the wastewater treatment plant. So what were we thinking about? Who are the local competition, other op op operations that might take it? Um, the residential grease, where is that going primarily? You know, Friends. generally everybody puts it in the landfill. Some people put it down the drain, bad idea, but it happens. And so, you know, just thinking through when you're looking at a feedstock is how complex the competition is for that. And really for that, I'm gonna skip right now, but the, the, the St. Pete, Petersburg, that was actually a big um, issue. What we found was that their market for brown grease, when we did the analysis, we had, there were people hauling it and everything else, but there was one hauler who had their own process facility who basically had a majority of the market share and were processing materials from other haulers. And so really, you know, we ended up saying is, yeah, you could get some grease trap waste, um, but you might also want to consider other ways if you, you get the gas production up to where you want it to be, because really you're, you're, you're competing against a local existing business who's already got a, a good portion of the, the work uh, uh, material captured. So it was an interesting um, study what we did, did there. Um, you know, similarly, you know, you, you, these market soundings can also help you understand the competition, right? What we've seen in the East, in the Bay Area, where there's lots and lots of fog stations, well, fog <laughs> and co-digestion programs, the 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 prime the prime waste that everybody likes, the easy ones are getting gobbled up and bid down, and 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 everybody's you know very competitive for them. So you know that also gets into your, into the long-term sustainability of the of the project. I'm now here's another one that I, I like to bring up is one we did for Bellingham, Washington, there um, north of Seattle, about an hour or so, and um, 
they they won't, had an incinerator that wanted to put grease in there. And when we did the market study, what we found was, yeah, there was grease out there. And yes, it was being collected. But when we talked to the haulers, they said basically they wouldn't use the facility. So we could build it and do the work and, you know, construct something. But it didn't fit within their business model. They had set up facilities um, closer down on the south side of Seattle. And that's how they were processing their material and they wouldn't have used our facility so um it really that, that project went from a hey let's build something to well how do we implement better management practices within the city to reduce the grease uh, overflows into the sewers rather than that so sometimes these market studies will be very valuable not only helping identify materials but then really giving a sense of what's truly available and and some of the some of the things that aren't necessarily obvious from looking at, you know, who's on your pre-treatment list, who, you know, who the haulers are, how many trucks are moving around and everything else. It's some, it's very valuable to getting in and talking to these folks directly. So, you know, really summing up the market side of things and in, 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 in the vetting process, you know, you, you, you want to collect things like data around volumes, specifically pricing, I find it's a hit or miss, right? If you ask the question of how, how much you want to pay to get rid of this, the answer you will get often is nothing. And that's not, <laughs> not the right answer. So it does take some work to, to figure out some of those, those elements. The practices I said of those two examples were important. Um, you know, where, where are they um, going with materials? Is it something they can divert from? Do they want to divert from? Uh, what types of services and access do you need? Some places are very, you know, um, line up haul out and move along uh, east bay mud their facility has a little break room and restrooms for haulers to <laughs> go to so it's it's all it's all it's very different for the different facilities going and the other big one is access when when can you get it you know those are things when you're starting to think about the feedstocks is like how to when how do all these elements match up to your needs and what you want to do with your facility do you want to provide 24 hour access, do you only want to have a small window of access, available access during, you know, the eight to four realm? What does that mean for the availability of those feedstocks? In terms of doing these, um, really, you know, we I've been involved with all of the different approaches, whether it's in-person calling, surveys, and I will tell you sending something out is the least effective way to do it. Uh, <laughs> it was very early on, but I'll be honest, uh, calling people directly, Going to their facilities, meeting with them is going to be the quickest and best way to get the best information and to help you understand the availability of those feedstocks and the potential quantity that you would get. So with that, I'm going to stop. I mean, there was the one element there, again, on the, on the economic side, but I, I wanted to turn the other part of this over to Bob because I think he's going to touch on that a lot better than um, and with a lot more uh, uh, firsthand experience to, to share you know with their facilities of how things turned out and what you know when you vet feedstocks and bring them in what does it really mean and and so with that i will take a break thanks chris you gonna click slides for me i will click slides for you sir all right fire away next one so thank you, chris um you know as Chris mentioned, a lot of the feedstocks uh, that that he had gone through and some of that data are ones that uh, that ESG and myself have worked with uh, in a number of different places. Um, you know, anywhere from the simple stuff uh, like the soft drink, uh, juice waste, all the way up to poultry daff, uh, which is full of uh, beaks, feet, and feathers. So you can just about get anything you want coming through a wastewater plant if you try. Um, and Chris, I'm going to let you take care of that question and I'll uh, keep talking. So, uh, next slide. Oh, there we go. Sorry, my computer fell asleep. Uh, again, as, as Chris talked about, these are uh, some of that information. Um, you know, there's a variety of different data points. There's a lot of papers that have been presented. You know, the, the database of information is getting better and better uh, over time. Um, but, you know, again, there's that stuff that just looks fantastic. You know, the for instance, the poultry daft sludge uh, that's listed here, 18% uh, solids, uh, yet it flows like a liquid, 96% um, volatile, um, and 97% and destructible. 
So this is uh, another one of those wastes that looks just phenomenally perfect uh, until you look at the ammonia characteristics and the TKN and realize that uh, for any facility that has to do any nutrient removal at a TKN value, uh, anywhere from 30 to 40,000, you just can't support that much nitrogen going back to the facility in the recycle streams. So quickly on to the, the next slide, we'll hit a little bit on the gas production uh, as, as Chris had shown, just a different way of showing this. Again, with uh, waste retrieval plant solids being down at the, at the lowest point, there's a lot of ways to continue to push gas production, uh, which has always been the original driver, I think, when folks thought of co-digestion was how could I make more gas out of it. But it's really, uh, as noted, a much more complex equation in that you're not only accounting for the amount of gas, but also what revenue can I get brought into the facility uh, in terms of tipping fees, and then what are ultimately going to be the costs uh, for all of that treatment. Um, and then the variety of different ways that that gas can then be monetized uh, and put forth into the system. Uh, so let's uh, take the next slide here. So the, the phrase has always been, if you build it, um, one, one back, Chris. Yeah, back. Sorry, it was a... You're killing me. <laughs> um, you know, if you build it, they will come has always been the thing. Um, most of the projects that, I, that I've worked on are ones where either uh, we're building new infrastructure and or we have to do major upgrades to existing guidance. So when you start thinking about that process, you know, in the best case scenario, you're two years out. In reality, you're probably four years out from the first time you talk about this concept uh, to when you're actually going to have uh, the co-digestion capacity about there. So what we found is if you're just talking about it, they're generally going to ignore you. And I'm referring to high strength waste suppliers here. Um, they get contacted nonstop about oh, I've got some other way for you to dispose your waste. How much are you willing to pay for it? And the reality is they've got a way to dispose of their waste today and something four years out is completely meaningless. To them. Uh, so it's really the progression. So as you design it, we found eh, they might give you some data. This is what we have. Here's some of the characteristics. Um, but we're still not really interested because it's just lines on a piece of paper. As you start to construct it, then you can start to have some real conversations because this is real concrete in the ground, you've committed, but often you're still a couple of years out from being able to accept it. So this is really the important phase of making contact and letting them know what the system's gonna be set up, what the options are, so they can start thinking about alternatives and planning. Unfortunately, in some cases, you may be uh, giving them the opportunity to really hammer their current supplier or current hauler and say, I got another alternative coming soon, so I better get a cut. But in some cases, uh, it gives them the opportunity to think about what they're really spending and is there a better way to approach it. And then finally, when it operates, you know, they may consider it coming. Because the worst thing that any uh, food waste producer can do is have an upset in how their system is operating. Their job is to make whatever that food product may be, uh, juice, soda, milk, whatever it is. Getting rid of the waste is an operational consideration. So what they do not want to do is start bringing waste and then you come back and say, you know, we're having some startup hiccups and uh, we need you to go somewhere else for a couple of months. Um, that is gonna kill the business. So it's important to make sure you're in a good stable position uh, before you're ready and to start taking that waste in. So the next couple of slides, just because I love pretty pictures of wastewater plants. Um, this is the Frederick Winchester of Peckin. Uh, wastewater facility. Uh, so brand new anaerobic digestion complex that uh, was constructed with the goal of doing co-digestion. Uh, two primary digesters and a secondary. Uh, the next photo is just a pretty set of heat exchangers and pumps because we all need to see those to brighten our January day. Um, and uh, moving on, so just getting into the, the details of this facility, we did that uh, kind of look that, that Chris noted. Um, the rectangular box is actually uh, uh, opportunities for waste up and down Interstate 81. Interstate is a 81 major highway in Virginia, West Virginia, PA, that runs about 10 minutes from this facility. So not only we were looking out in a radius of what potential sources were out there, but also up and down 81, because it's not so much the as the crow flies distance, it's really, where can I get to a facility in basically a two hour round trip? 
um, because that's enough that the amount of fuel and time uh, justifies potentially paying a little bit more to dispose of waste at that facility. And you can see that in both of those, uh, you know, 25 mile radius and up and down, uh, you know, the 50 mile uh, uh, up and down 81, there are a number of different facilities and, and viable options for co-digestion at a Next slide. So when we, uh, when we first started looking, we were trying to make sure we had an anchor client uh, going forward. And with all of these different uh, opportunities that were out there, we did find two anchor clients uh, who agreed to come on to the process before the facility was constructed. Uh, Valley Proteins, which is a, a rendering and, and fog uh, processing facility, which has their corporate headquarters right in Winchester. So this was perfect from a local economic development standpoint. And then Kraft Foods, which also had a facility in town. So with that, uh, one of the things that we did was we didn't tie either anchor client uh, to have to do everything uh, that had to be done there. Um, so we were able to uh, provide a facility that could do everything with either one. So if you go to the, the next slide, Ultimately, uh, this facility ended up with uh, grease trap waste, uh, biofuel waste, dairy waste, and poultry uh, coming in. Um, so a variety of different grease trap waste haulers, uh, some uh, biodiesel manufacturers, uh, dairy processors and the like. Uh, but one thing that's not on this of, uh, of contracts that happened over the first couple of years was uh, Kraft, one of the anchor clients. And the reasons for that, I'll, I'll say it twofold, and, I, and I'm gonna sound a little facetious, but I mean it. One is people change jobs and two, lawyers exist. Um, so if you have someone who's a lawyer, you know, I like them, but they do have a job and sometimes it gets in the way. Um, so when we originally talked with some folks at Kraft, the facility director moved on to another position within the company. So no longer was this something that uh, the new facility director had a vested interest in. Uh, so there was delay in that. And then unfortunately, you know, we got into uh, some legal issues in that working with a large corporation, there were questions about uh, uh, releasing and confidentiality on the waste coming in. So can a public agency sign a confidentiality agreement? Uh, with the FOIA uh, uh, rules that are out there. So that ultimately became a, a legal circle uh, that went around and around in circles. And by the time finally we got resolution, the facility was up and running and taking in enough waste that it really didn't matter anymore. So it's kind of been one of those situations that pops up every so often. But as you're looking at identifying different wastes, you need to make sure that there are opportunities um, to have different ways to go. So relative to the uh, duration of the contracts question that I just saw pop up, uh, duration of contracts is variable by hauler. Uh, we've seen them anywhere from one to about five years. Um, each contract will have basically a, a set of good practices, uh, i.e. Uh, the driver has to have a set of good practices in terms of how they respect the facility, access time, availability, and then characteristics of the waste in terms of what is and is not acceptable uh, for certain different types of waste. Um, so not here, but as, uh, as Chris mentioned, um, you know, uh, talking about food producers and making sure you understand the seasonality of their production. The other thing to be very careful with with them is uh, getting track of what they're doing around the holidays. Because um, what we found from a number of producers is that the Thanksgiving shutdown and the Christmas shutdown usually ends up with some sort of specialized cleaning or flushing of the system. And all of a sudden, the characteristics of the waste can change dramatically, either from a toxicity standpoint, if they're using a cleaning agent uh, that can potentially interfere with nitrification or digestion, and or they may be mm -hmm. flushing out components of their system that are inconsistent with the type of waste that they've been bringing in the past. So we worked with a, um, a, a meat uh, smoker who came in uh, with one load that was typically 4% solids and showed up one day with a 25% solid load, um, thinking that, well, you know, it's just a little bit different. It still pumps on and off my truck, so you guys will be fine. And the reality couldn't take that load 
um, because they had cleaned out their system and flushed out some tanks that hadn't been had worked on in a while. So those are the sorts of conversations that are very important to have uh, with those haulers coming in. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, so just a little bit uh, at, at a peck in, you know, from that first year startup, they were bringing in uh, more than a million gallons a month uh, of different types of waste. And the next one, uh, which was resulting in a revenue somewhere between 70 and $90,000 per month. Uh, so a lot of uh, potential revenue coming in. Certainly this came with additional operating costs, uh, but still they were netting out six, uh, five to six hundred thousand uh, dollars per year in additional uh, revenue uh, and profit. All right, so uh, let's get down to uh, just a quick summary of that in terms of, you know, if you build it, you know, plan early, the market is variable. You can't have certainty. So you can ask for it all you want, uh, but we're getting into business. Um, so you have to just plan for variability. Very important to understand that you need the material. It doesn't matter necessarily who brings it. So find out who is the controlling source. Sometimes it's that the haulers uh, have a long-term contract for the material, and it may be the hauler that wants different alternatives. It's not necessarily the facility itself. Um, as uh, Chris noted, uh, sometimes the limiting factor is HRT and SRT. Sometimes it's the amount of solids you can process or the amount of land that you have available for uh, land out. So you got to figure out what that is. And this is not for everybody. This is a business. So if you want to think that this is just normal operation, it's not. Uh, you've got customers that you got to take care of. You got variabilities. Um, and you need to have that business-minded mindset to, to go through it. So I'm going to switch uh, gears a little bit for this next uh, talk, uh, next piece, and that's uh, getting the right tools. Uh, so Chris talked a little bit about uh, removing debris from, uh, from grease trap waste. Uh, so this is some of the debris coming out of the grease trap waste there. You know, we've got rags and straws and all sorts of various pieces of, of stuff that come in. and then. Really, as we start to push these digesters for the next slide here, Chris, um, you know, we got to get to the source. So on the right there, uh, you can see some raw grease trap waste that's coming in there. You know, lots of, uh, lots of fog and, and uh, grease and, and material that you really wouldn't want to uh, put in there. I'll take another click. So, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of different people say, you know, you put more than 30% fog into it um, or something else or come up with all these different numbers, you know, a digester's going to fail. And you just click through these couple bullet points here. And just remember that a lot of these are pilot and bench scale testing that was done. You know, I survived getting my master's, you know, I survived watching Chris get his master's and then uh, have fun with his uh, PhD. So I am all for abusing grad students. Um, you know, it's that, that fun piece of I've done it so someone else should have to go through it. But very often, uh, a lot of the numbers that we see published are uh, from pilot or bench scale testing where, you know, you've got 20 liter digesters. So you're feeding a liter a day. You know, if you want to feed that digester continuously, uh, you're feeding 42 milli milliliters an hour, you know, which 2.8 tablespoons an hour. You know, these are systems that you can't set up to run like you would a digester. So you end up slug feeding them. Sometimes you end up feeding them once a day. Sometimes it's every other day. Uh, some of the, if you go back and trace uh, that 30% number, that's a digester that is fed every other day. So when you do the instantaneous loading on what that digester was fed, it's an amazing amount of material that went into it uh, in a slug load which we would never do in a digester. So make sure as you see these numbers, go and figure out what the true source and how the digester was fed, because these things are much more robust. We can push digesters to 200, 250, 400 pounds of loading. Um, we know we can do it, provided we do it well. So go on to the next slide. Um, part of that is mixing at the right point. So that's raw fog waste on the side. If you put in a high energy mixing with that and, and TWAS, that is mixed TWAS uh, with all of that fog in there. You can get a very nice homogenous feed that digesters love. Next one. And then, you know, 
finally, just to sum that up, you know, feed a digester slowly and consistently, feed it all, as much as you can, uh, get a nice wide spot uh, before and after, and you can do a lot of these digesters, with these digesters. So uh, run a little bit short on time, but I'm gonna hit real quick on uh, one more thing that Chris had mentioned, which is how do you take a program like this and deal with other needs that you have at the facility? So let's go on to Beckley. Um, so this is Beckley, West Virginia. Uh, next one. Uh, the problem at Beckley is with, with many small communities, uh, population growth is non-existent. Um, so, you know, there's just nothing to support uh, the infrastructure that exists. Next one. Uh, just real quick, you know, they've, they've seen almost no change in their amount of sewer fees coming in. Um, uh, so over time, so there's a, a challenge and I've got old infrastructure We've seen this at a number of different facilities. You can go to the next slide there, there Chris. Um, you know, these are, are plants where operators are doing absolutely everything they can to hold together equipment, but there just hasn't been an investment in it over time. So you get old pumps, you get old material, you can go to the, the Belfast press. So, you know, <clears throat> this is a, a 25, 30 year old press that uh, they're doing everything they can to hold it together, but there just hasn't been an investment. So when we go through these projects, and you go to the next one, Chris. Um, so when we looked at this facility, they needed about $11 million of investment in core infrastructure. So this was digester covers, heat exchangers, mixing pumps, mixing, dewatering, UV system, aeration, uh, grit removal, and some miscellaneous upgrades to the facility. So that's what they had to do. So when we worked with them, we said, you know, if you spent another $2 million, you could add in the components of the facility that would allow you to do co-digestion. So this is the receiving station, some site civil improvements to allow trucks to get in and out, uh, upsizing the gas system, uh, putting in a, a, a wide spot after digestion so that you could have two primary digesters running at once, um, along with some other miscellaneous improvements. So that made the total project about $13 million. So in terms of bringing and offsetting that, ESG brought a guarantee to the table that said you would get over 15 years about $6 million in co-digestion revenue uh, netted out uh, from the other operating costs, additional fossils and, and the like, with a potential uh, to bring in another four and a half million if you fully maxed out the capacity of the digester. So when you add all of that together, um, you've got $11 million of core infrastructure that you have to improve. The potential to net on the upside, eight and a half million dollars. So all of a sudden you have the potential to do a project where you got $11 million of your capital investment done for basically two and a half million dollars in four months. So this is a way for facilities to take the core infrastructure that they have, which is really the concrete and the ground, and how do you upgrade that with the mechanical equipment uh, that is at the end of its useful life? The work's got to be done anyway. So if you want to spend $11 million and not get anything to offset it, go ahead. I don't know where you're going to find the money, uh, but you got to do it anyway. So this is an opportunity to do that without burdening your ratepayers uh, with additional uh, fees. So from that, uh, we'll show some pretty pictures of what it looks like after the fact. Um, so brand new belt filter presses, uh, new pumps, all looking nice and pretty. And uh, you know, the next one is uh, you know, new covers, new mixers, so forth and so on. And basically uh, for the, the cost of running a co-digestion uh, facility, you end up with all this uh, new equipment. So. With that, and, you know, no one can tell you anything in tap, but you really can. Um, but it's not free. You do have to invest money in it. Um, and ultimately, uh, you can get to a, a solution. So I'm right at one o'clock. I don't know how far we can go over, Janine. Um, um, if we could try and answer some of these questions, uh, Bob, that'd be great. I mean, we have okay. a few folks, and maybe I can follow up with your yeah. slides and the answers to the questions if they miss them. Okay. Um, I'll take the first one that I promised uh, earlier, which was the recuperative thickening in Montpelier. Um, so in recuperative thickening, um, what we're doing is uh, utilizing a mechanical thickening device. In Montpelier, it's a drum thickener. Uh, at 
Beckley, we did a uh, belt filter press, uh, GBT, uh, with the uh, gravity zone. Um, and ultimately, what you do is you're running it as if it's an activated sludge plant, in that you're taking the contents of the digester, putting it across uh, a thickening device, taking the water out, and then sending the solids back into the digester. So what that does is it breaks the SRT HRT relationship. And since it's only the SRT that you need uh, for 503 compliance, and the reality is that that SRT is really what you need for breaking down the WAS and the primary that's in there, the uh, high strength waste feed stocks break down very quickly. So you're just wasting out um, you know, water and uh, allowing the digester to take more solids over time. Um, it does require uh, enough heating in the system because you're taking heat out of the system and also putting in a new cold sludge. So you gotta have sufficient heating to do that um, and the ability to then uh, deal with the additional gas production that's out there. So it's a, it's a way of, uh, of increasing the organic load without uh, having to build more tankage. Uh, Chris, are you on uh, micronutrients, or what do you want to do? Yeah, I'll, I'll, you can hear me? Yep. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, so, yeah, the micronutrients th element, generally what we've seen with, with co-digestion facilities, when it is included with sewage sludge, we don't run into micronutrient limitations. And that kind of gets to Bob's comment earlier about um, the needs, you know, 30%, 40%, 50%, um, what's the right loading mixture? I, where I've understood micro uh, process limitations come and they can be on the micronutrient side, they can also be on the macronutrient side is, uh, you know, uh, like too much ammonia, right? You can have too much, you can blend it out and that's kind of how East Bay Mud takes in blood waste. But on the micronutrient side, when you start to get more into the, you know, project processes without sludge in them, um, without municipal sludge in them, you can start to see it. And that's, I think, especially when you start to get towards like 100% food waste only digesters, then you're gonna start to see limitations on things like molybdenum, um, zinc, uh, cobalt, all those items. And that's where you, you might need to do some, you know, there's, you do a quick characterization of the sludge and you can come up with your little cocktail that you dose in to make, make up the, the, the lack of those. But yeah, in general, what we've seen in municipal systems is not so much a limitation. It's more when you get into the really high loads of the, the co-digestion relative to the, 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 the sewage sludge, you know. I think, um, yeah, that, that's where I'd kind of keep yep, that. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree, I'd, I'd say on that. Um, you know, take advantage of what's in the WAS and primary because it's a great alpha buffer uh, and also provides those micronutrients. Uh, actually, the next one is I have not seen anyone else do food scraps at the plant. I'll let Chris say if he's seen any others. Uh, the one thing as we've, as it's come up as a concept, um, the biggest limitation that I have seen is that it becomes a separate permitting issue in that now you are a solid waste processing facility um, and that is something that I have no desire to go down that permitting pathway. If someone else wants to, more power to you. Um, Chris, I don't know if you've seen any others. No, I, so yeah, it, 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 it's, I have not seen per se like a, a municipal, municipal wastewater treatment plant bringing on site the, the, the processing and it gets into the permitting. The other issue gets into is there is a reject rate from those, mater those materials and it's upwards of 30% of the mass you still have to deal with those rejects. And so, um, you know, like when I, some work on it, when we were doing with the city of Tacoma, there was talk of that. One of the operators about had a heart attack when he said, well, they, you know, somebody wants to bring <laughs> trash to the plant and then process it. And I'm like, well, no, no, no. And it, because it, it, there is a backhaul side of it. So, you know, it, having it done at a transfer station, having it done off site by somebody who, who manages that, it does make sense because they have the outlets for that and they can bring you something that looks like, um, waste act really thick waste activated sludge. I mean that that that's where we, when I was doing the work with Tacoma, that's what we found was that that was the right setup. Um, 
and you can figure out the water needs pretty pretty quickly. Wastewater plants have no shortage of water, and you go back all to take a tank back if you need to. So, and there's also a lot of you know odors that can think about too. Yep. So a couple of these um, I think are generally co uh, just comments. Um, yeah. So and you, you answered know, the contract question already. Yeah, I got the contract. All right. I mean, I can I can copy these and just make sure we got them all answered and follow yeah. up with folks after the fact. But um, you know, I appreciate the extra five minutes that everyone spent here to to get some uh, more discussion going. Uh, and I just want to thank everyone for attending. And I really want to thank Chris and Bob. That was a good tag team. Uh, seems like you guys have done this before. But I, I learned a lot and I really appreciate you sharing your expertise with all of our Nebra members here today. Also, I just want to get, remind everyone next quarter, quarter we'll hear from Greater Lawrence Sanitary District who is doing co-digestion about their startup starts and stops, I guess, in uh, coming to a steady state operation now. Unless uh, somebody wants to turn on their mic and, and ask Chris or Bob a question while we have them, um, I would say that we're, we're all done. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Bob. Well, thanks, Janine. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Have a good weekend. Yep. Same here. Bye, guys. All right. Thank you.